Joining us on POTUS is Dr. William Rosenberg. He's a professor of political science at Drexel University. He is tweeting at Dr. B. Rosenberg and joins us now. Bill, welcome back. Thanks for being here today. Good morning. There, uh, you, you do a lot of, uh, obviously, teaching about it. And you've studied presidential campaigns and uh, the candidacy of John McCain in 2008 and 2000, quite frankly, sort of cemented him as a, as a kind of an icon, if you will, of, well, the, the, you know, the, the straight talk express and so on. Give us your sense of, of the kind of impact he will have on the history books. Well, I think it's been truly remarkable, the response that um, John McCain has uh, received since his passing. Uh, both Democrats and Republicans are effusive about how positive his impact has been on the political scene in the United States and basically the world. Um, the, the homage it's paid by people that were politically in opposition to some of his ideas, but also politically joining hands with them to pass bipartisan legislation is really a, um, a feat that is so much um, no longer in vogue. Um, people in the political middle uh, don't exist really anymore in Congress, and as a result, polarization is sort of the watchword for the day. When you Interestingly, though, the, but Senator McCain was not really um, in the middle philosophically, right? I mean, he was a staunch conservative on a lot of issues. But to your point, I think he was also willing to say, look, I, I don't know all the answers and I can you know, maybe work with some people because we're never going to get anything done if we don't at least work, talk to the other side. There's no question that he was a conservative. There's no question that he comes from a long military family tradition. But at the same time, he was able to craft agreements with those people on the opposite side. If you really go back and take a look at things like um, the uh, deals that he made with Ted Kennedy, um, with Russ Feingold over um, campaign finance report, uh, reform, these are really things that sort of served as a uh, as a an example about how politics is supposed to be the politics of compromise, not just the politics of holding on to your position and never releasing any sort of uh, benefit to your opposition. Bill Rosenberg, I, I wonder, uh, as you say, this seems to be a change uh, or an evolution of politics, and one wonders if there is a return to politics uh, of the kind that Senator McCain spoke of, or is, is this the future of politics in this country? Well, I would I would suggest that in general we have not seen a return to politics of cooperation. One of the remarkable things, though, I think that uh, McCain's passing has shown is that Democrats and Republicans can can be positive about uh, many of the things that John McCain was able to accomplish. The one noticeable ex uh, exemption to this is the response that we've been seeing over the past two weeks in particular, but for a long time as well, by President Trump. Uh, President Trump just gave a speech, I believe, in Pennsylvania, talking about the new Military Appropriations uh, Act that was passed that was named after uh, John McCain. And in the whole speech, he never could once mention McCain's name. These are two people that really did not like each other. Uh, and if we take a look as we go through this week, uh, the uh, presence of uh, Donald Trump is not welcomed at his funeral. He's not invited. But he did invite two of his former adversaries, George W. Bush and Barack Obama, both to eulogize him. At the same time, he did invite Mike Pence, but I imagine Mike Pence's role is going to be very small. Yeah, well, and I guess he'll go. I, I, it's interesting that, you know, people are criticizing President Trump for being, uh, you know, personal, taking this personally and not acknowledging Senator McCain. And it, it does seem like one of the few times, though, that Senator McCain took it personally because he didn't even invite the current president yeah, to be at his, at his memorial. Absolutely. It was his, yeah. his parting shot to Donald Trump. And, and I his think last thumbs really down. What, it really exposes um, the, the, um, the animosity between the two of them. I um, mean, you, know, you have uh, a lot of these specials that are on various networks uh, where basically we see uh, um, John McCain's friends in the Senate, people like Biden and, and uh, Hillary Clinton and uh, Barack Obama, all talking about the close working relationship and friendship that they had, as well as Republicans like Lindsey Graham. 
Again, Bill Rosenberg with us, professor of political science at Drexel University. I got to touch on something else. This weekend, the DNC had its annual meeting, and they've decided to change their superdelegate rules, which were put in place in, 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 you know, in 1968, there was a riot at the Democratic Convention in Chicago. Therefore, they changed the rules. And in 1972, it was just chaos, which resulted in George McGovern being the nominee. And Democrats say, we don't want that happening again. So they started doing this thing with superdelegates. They've made some more changes Where's the Democratic Party going and what are they trying to do? Well, I think they're trying to uh, feel their way towards being what they consider more representative. Uh, It's very interesting that you bring up the 1968 convention because as a result of the 1968 convention, there was a very famous commission formed, the the, um, the McGovern-Fraser Commission, that basically set out those new rules that came into place in 1972. Unfortunately for the Democrats, those new rules produced maybe a more representative Democratic Party, but also one of the most disastrous defeats they've ever had. So if we take a look at what's happening today um, with the superdelegate rules that have been in place with the Democrats having about 15 percent superdelegates and the Republicans having far fewer, um, those superdelegates were basically the, the bastion of the establishment Uh, party members in both the Democratic and Republican Party, but more so in the Democratic Party. And they were sort of um, sort of controlling a little bit of the process uh, in a way that people like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were not so happy with, principally because Hillary Clinton had over 400 uncommitted, excuse me, superdelegates who had already committed to her before the first vote was ever cast, which in a sense, casted a long shadow over the possibility of uh, Bernie Sanders ever being able to win. And as a result, he started out in a major hole. I so think, I think, the, Senate, I think the, the I think the Democrats kind of envisioned that sort of like the Senate versus the uh, House of Representatives, you know, the, to yeah, cool the, the more hot tea. But, uh, but I think uh, Carl Rove called it the House of Lords versus <laughs> the House of Commons, which I think played very poorly for uh, for Democrats. Absolutely. And I, and I think what happens is that they're trying to get out from under that rock. And, and basically, they've come up with this compromise, which is kind of an odd compromise, uh, that the superdelegates, while they will be at the convention and will participate, will not get to vote on the first ballot. But after the first ballot, they can vote. So it's sort of a, a compromise where they're saying, well, superdelegates can play a role if the party is not firmly convinced on the first ballot who the nominee should be. So in a sense, it's kind of a a small step, but the Democrats in particular have to be careful because if they open up their party uh, and take away the power of uh, the establishment within the Democratic Party, the people that are congressmen, governors, senators, big city mayors, and so forth, they lose that institutional memory and they become sort of at the whim of delegates who were chosen to represent particular candidates who may have less of a tradition with the party, and even more so, um, maybe lead themselves a little bit more to candidates such as Bernie Sanders, who will not even state that he's a Democrat. So you have to recognize that the political parties are not government organizations. They're private organizations. Their, their role is to nominate people. They're going to run in a general election. But the party is a organization that has the ability to make its own rules and choose who it wants to represent them as long as they don't violate any constitutional provisions. Wasn't it Will Rogers who said, I'm not a member of any organized party, I'm a Democrat? We'll see how this turns out in, uh, in 2020. Dr. Bill Rosenberg, thanks so much. All right. Have a great day. Bye-bye. You too. Dr. William Rosenberg is a professor of political science at Drexel University. Joining us, thoughts on Senator John McCain and as well as the DNC uh, rules changes. He is tweeting at Dr. B. Rosenberg at Dr. B. R-O-S-E-N-B-E-R-G.